Good afternoon, all. Um, my name is Dahi O'Kalik. I'm the chair of the UK group in the Institute, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you here in person uh, to this um, seminar on Scotland's constitu constitutional future and the implications for Ireland and for Northern Ireland. Uh, we have a panel of five speakers. I'll introduce them as we go along. Four of them are present here, and one uh, is on Zoom. I should also add that there are over 100 people on the Zoom platform today uh, listening in, which is very good. And um, uh, without further ado, uh, I'll introduce our, our first speaker, who is uh, Mary Black. Uh, she's uh, an MP uh, for a Scottish constituency for the Scottish Nationalist Party. Um, she was the youngest uh, when she was first elected to Parliament in 2015. And I think she's probably pretty much still the youngest. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, she's going to, uh, each speaker will have about seven minutes, which altogether will add up to 35, but if I know my speakers, it'll probably more likely be 45, and then we can go on with questions and a discussion uh, until 10 past four. So, Mary, you're very welcome. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, at first, I thought you were going to say I was the MP for my sins, <laughs> but <laughs> I'll take that. Um, also to surprise you, I, I'll be surprised if I do talk for seven minutes, um, because I always find with these events, it's much better and more informative when people are allowed to ask questions and we can address the issues that folk want to. Um, so first of all, I would just want to say thank you for inviting me along here. Um, not least of all, because it gets me out of Westminster for a day. Uh, I'm always appreciative of that. But more seriously, there are, of course, constitutional discussions happening in Scotland and across the UK and in Ireland uh, as well. And of course, as we know throughout our histories, our shared histories, what happens in one part of these isles always has an impact on other parts of the isles. Um, now for us in Scotland, of course, I am a member of the Scottish National Party. I believe in Scottish independence. I, I want to see it happen. And I am absolutely certain that it is an inevitability that Scotland will be independent. It's just a matter of when and how that happens. And the reason that I want to see Scottish independence isn't for any romanticized reason or even emotive reason. For me, it's a completely logical thing. I think that, as in fact, as we've lived through just in the last few years, the world is unpredictable. Things can get flung out of nowhere that you did not expect to happen, which is why it's so important that you get governments that you vote for. And actually, more importantly, you can get rid of governments by voting. And in Scotland, that is not the situation that we are in. And the frustration for me is we are always told that it's a, 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 a union of equals, that we are a, a family of nations. And... In 2014, when we had an independence referendum, the one thing that Scotland was told was leave the UK, don't, don't leave us. And what we've seen since then is almost every single scare story has come true. I remember standing in doorsteps and saying, look, can you imagine what Britain could look like if we had Boris Johnson as prime minister dragging us out of Europe with Nigel Farage nipping at his heels? And lo and behold, it's happened. And from that Brexit process, an entire amount of ugliness, I would say, has been unleashed in the United Kingdom. And not just in terms of culturally, but when we look at the priorities of this UK government, it scares me because we see a government clamping down on workers' rights, clamping down on the rights to protest, insulating ourselves, cutting ourselves off from the rest of the world. And it's not a pleasant experience. And I can say that as someone who works in the heart of Westminster, it's definitely not a great experience. So when we look over to Ireland, from Scotland certainly, it's with hope, it's with an element of inspiration, it's seeing the success stories that exist in Ireland. Even I think this year, Ireland has seen the, the biggest growth in its economy out of all the countries in Europe. Compare that to the UK, which is shrinking its economy. 
And of course, when you're coming out of things like COVID and in the middle of a cost of living crisis, a shrinking economy is not good news for anybody. When you then fling into the mix that we have a conservative government that seem quite happy to play about with the peace process that's been implemented in Ireland, who have been for years quite happy to challenge and have a question mark over what the reality of relationship will be between Northern Ireland and, and the Republic. Thankfully, we seem to have come to a, a fairly sensible position. But again, from a Scottish perspective, we are now looking at Northern Ireland having the very deal that we wanted and we're told that it wasn't possible. So for me, independence is about us stepping up to the rest of the world. It's not about separating ourselves from other countries in Britain, but rather sitting at the table with them as equals, being able to hold equal sway as every other nation does. And that's something that I definitely think we will see in my lifetime. And if I can play a part in that, I am more than happy to do so. But thank you again for inviting me along here and I will answer your questions as best I can. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, we keep the questions and the discussion until everybody has just said their introduction. Our next speaker is Mike Nesbitt. He's an old friend. He was a journalist for many, many years. Uh, before be joining the Ulster Unionist Party, eventually becoming a, um, uh, the leader of the Ulster Unionist Party. Mike has always uh, engaged across the spectrum in Northern Ireland, and you've always engaged with the Republic. Mike, you're very welcome. Cathy, thank you very much. And, and again, thank you to the IIEA for the invitation. I think I, I feel uh, the hand of a mutual friend, Terry Neal, behind the invitation. I, I fondly imagine him persuading you and the the committee let's get Nesbitt he's not very good but he's cheap <laughs> so um, I'm kind of conflicted with my opening remarks because on the one hand I'm a unionist so self-evidently I am for preserving the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland and I'm not here to to endorse the idea of Scottish independence but having said that uh, I'm really uncomfortable with the kind of asymmetrical nature of devolution around the United Kingdom particularly as it applies to any uh, protocols that are in place for votes on leaving the UK, because we have plenty, you don't have any actually. So for example, the 1998 Belfast Good Friday Agreement is explicit. Northern Ireland remains part of the United Kingdom unless or until a majority voting in a referendum opt for change. But there's other parts that, that don't apply to Scotland, and they're in the 1998 Act, which gives legal, uh, legal enforcement of the agreement. So in Schedule 1, there are two things to bear in mind. The first is that addresses the idea of a second or third or multiple referenda, uh, and it says explicitly that you can do that. The only restriction is that there must be a gap of at least seven years between polls. But given that the Scottish independence vote was 2014, you're well out of time, you're two years over that limit, but you don't have that facility given to you. And the only other thing I would mention, which again is in Schedule 1 of the 1998 Act, is that you can't just call a referendum on your constitutional future willy-nilly. The Secretary of State has to be convinced that it is, quote-unquote, likely that the majority voting would vote to leave the United Kingdom and join a united Ireland. So in terms of political consistency, why would I not wish to confer the same rights uh, to my colleagues uh, in the Scottish Parliament? Because we don't have to, once we start a border poll, we don't have to go back to Westminster to ask permission to do it again. So in 2014, uh, I was the leader of the Ulster Unionist Party at the time of the independence referendum, and there was some interest in uh, what, what position are you taking? And my view was that whatever the outcome of the referendum, uh, that a recalibration of the politics of the United Kingdom was inevitable. And to some extent that happened. You had your Smith Commission in Scotland. We saw more of these elected executive mayors uh, around the UK. Uh, and we saw city deals. And so the whole direction of travel uh, for our politics was to get power out of the traditional seats of London, Edinburgh, Cardiff, Belfast, uh, through councils, into communities, because the whole lesson was, 
if you want to affect positive change in people's lives, get that informed decision making as close as you possibly can to the domestic unit, whatever that domestic unit is. So as an aside, but maybe an important one, you might question why it is that that hasn't happened in Belfast. Why all those powers we repatriated from Westminster in 1998 have largely been retained at Stormont and not rolled off the hill, as I say, towards the domestic unit. And my answer is that for the last 16 years, that's because the two parties leading our executive, or not, as the case may be, are mirror images of each other in that they're both command and control parties who hold on to the power uh, up at Parliament buildings and, and Stormont Castle. So the, the question that's being posed is, what do I think the implications for Northern Ireland should Scotland leave the Union? And actually, I think we're into kind of Donald Rumsfeld known unknowns here. And the first thing I would want to know is if that were to happen, what would be the strength of English nationalism at that time? Because I think it is one of the great ironies and, and for fans of Four Weddings and a Funeral, I do Four Ironies and a Paradox, which we might return to later. But one of the ironies is for centuries, literally for centuries, I have looked over my shoulder, my predecessors have, at Irish nationalists as the great threat to our place in the Union. Today, the Irish nationalists barely make the podium. Scottish nationals in, in silver medal place, but the gold medal holders at the moment are English nationalism. And we're talking about people who weren't prepared to pay, shall we say, nine billion a year for membership of the single market, to access to that 500 million market. So if Scotland were to leave, I would fear there'd be a renewed focus for English nationalism on Northern Ireland, and the fact that they're paying about 15 billion a year to keep us as members of the United Kingdom. And the thought process there could very quickly go to, well, that's an acute new hospital in my constituency. That's Bobby's on my beat. That's classroom assistance in our schools, in our towns. And that's where I think the real danger uh, is for Northern Ireland, uh, should we go down that route. Change, though, is inevitable. And I think that's particularly difficult for, for Ulster Unionists or Unionists in Northern Ireland because we are forever looking for the final agreed solution, whether it's partition in the 20s or the Belfast Good Friday Agreement in the 90s. We are always trying to say, right, that is it. That is the settled issue, and, and it's settled from here to the end of eternity. And it's never, ever, ever going to be like that. So I will finish with a thought, which, which may be controversial. But I think while change is inevitable, the least likely outcomes are the status quo and the traditional 32 county single sovereign state. In other words, we are not going back to, to 1801, but nor are we delivering in its entirety the vision of the 1916 proclamation. Thank you very much. Next we have, and it's, it's uh, on the Zoom platform, we have uh, Professor Nicola McKeown, who is a professor of public policy in the University of Glasgow, and who's written widely on politics uh, in Scotland. Professor, you're very welcome. Thank, thank you so much. And I'm so sorry I wasn't able to be there with you today. Um, hopefully my connection will survive. Uh, this is a little bit glitchy. Um, I, I mean, I thought I would maybe set out a little bit of context um you will of course be very aware um that there are ongoing challenges and issues for the independence movement and in particular uh, for the SNP um which makes independence perhaps look a little bit further off uh, than it did a year ago or certainly an independence referendum um not because support for independence has declined it hasn't but support for the SNP has, um, and it remains the primary vehicle uh, for independence uh, within Scotland, the primary vehicle, but not the only one. And I think critically, that process, were it to unfold, would have to have the consent of the UK Parliament, at least to facilitate uh, the referendum process. We know that now. Um, and I, I think the next 
the next opportunity in a sense for, for anything like that to take shape would be the UK general election of next year. Um, and well, we don't know um, how, the, how the chips will fall um, at that point. That's still a long way off. Um, I think whatever the constitutional status of Scotland um, within the UK or as an independent uh, nation state, uh, there will always be interdependence. There will always be interdependence across these islands. Um, and I think the, there is an opportunity there for, for Ireland, if we do get to that point, to shape um, what that looks like. And clearly there are challenges at the moment in the context of Brexit around managing and governing that interdependence. Um, but um, there is... There's opportunities for things to evolve on all fronts. Um, and I think the relationships across these islands will inevitably be shaped by the UK's relationship with the European Union, which, which itself uh, will evolve uh, over time. Um, so I, I agree that change is inevitable and that nothing stays still and there are no lines in the sand that that won't. Um, erode uh, over time. Um, but I don't see independence as inevitable. Um, I only look to Quebec um, as a potentially significant comparative example, and it would be a mistake to assume that each new generation, because the young are the most supportive of independence right now, we shouldn't assume that the next generation of young people will be equally but even more enthusiastic in their support for independence. Change can go in different directions, but for now, all we can say is that the independence remains an issue that divides Scotland. Um, it's not anywhere close to being um, what we used to talk about in terms of a Scottish Parliament as the settled will um, of the people of Scotland. Um, so I, I don't see it as inevitable, but let's assume that at some point, um, it happens and that it happens uh, with consent as part of a legal and consensual process, um, which I think is the only realistic uh, way that it would happen. What would that mean for Ireland, um, North and South? Um, it's interesting, I hadn't thought of the potential of English nationalism being a consequence of that. I thought perhaps a more likely consequence but not not so much more likely i think that you know that may well be uh, likely but the one that had that came to my mind in terms of a consequence for northern ireland and indeed for wales is that they become even more marginal in the minds of those who govern um westminster and whitehall um without scotland there then devolution in a sense within the uk is is potentially uh, diminished and easy to ignore and so, you know, it may, be, may well be that it moves in other directions that are more politicised as well. What about the consequences for Ireland? Um, I think an independent Scotland would be looking to Ireland uh, as an ally, um, both to shape the governing of these islands under new arrangements, but also as an ally as it seeks to negotiate accession to the European Union, it seeks to establish itself as a successful small independent nation state. And, and there would be opportunities where Ireland inclined uh, to try to support that um, and form alliances there. And of course, once Scotland is up and running as a new uh, nation state, which would take time, um, there would be a, an ally there for Ireland too, um, particularly within the European Union. It may also be a competitor. So as another small English language um, advanced economy in Europe and in the European Union, um, would there be competition uh, there uh, too? Um, there may be national interests that don't always uh, align. Um, and potentially, would there be a knock-on effect for the unity debate uh, within, within Ireland? Um, that's possible. I would hope if there was, it would be positive in the way that it could be done as with consensus um, and as a consensual process and one that I would hope would find ways to accommodate those who didn't want uh, that outcome. So 
to nurture losers' consent, in other words. And the final point is that there are opportunities for mutual learning uh, now, uh, even before you get to, to that point, uh, for the unity debate in terms of how you govern a diverse society and the different constitutional structures that maybe, uh, that maybe can evolve, whether it's in the context of the UK, whether it's in the context of, of a united Ireland, or indeed whether it's in the context of an independent Scotland, which, it, which itself would have to think about its own internal structures if, if it was to represent the diversity uh, that Scotland features. Thank you. Much Thank you. Our next speaker is Graham Walker. He's a professor emeritus uh, of uh, Queen's University, Belfast. And he's written extensively on Scotland, on the relationship between Scotland and Northern Ireland and, and Northern Unionism. You're very welcome. Thanks very much. And, and I too am very grateful for the, uh, for the invitation. Um, back in the 1990s, I published a book on Scotland's relationship with Northern Ireland, and I called it Intimate Strangers. Now, this title was deliberately chosen to try and capture something of the ambiguity in that relationship. Two places which were culturally very close, a lot of shared history, but in many ways political strangers. Um, I think there were plenty of issues even then in the 1990s uh, of a political kind which linked the two places, but I think it's fair to say that they were they were not well appreciated. Uh, they were rather obscured, if, if you will. Um, nowadays, I think that's very, very different. It's quite clear um, the political connections and interactions that they are um, around devolution, for example, uh, around identity questions, maybe in particular the, the question of British identity, um, around community divisions and sectarianism. Uh, sectarianism, something that was discussed exhaustively in the uh, in the the last twenty years in Scotland, um, but most pertinently, I think, around uh, speculation and debate about the constitutional futures of both places, uh, namely, of course, whether Scotland should be independent or whether there should be Irish unity or whether the UK Union uh, will survive. Now. If Scotland was independent, it would profoundly affect Northern Ireland, um, particularly uh, the unionist community there. I think it would be a hammer blow to them psychologically. Um, the idea of breaking up the UK and leaving this rump UK, which has already been mentioned, uh, in which they would be even more marginal than they are at the moment. Um, just in passing, I would say that if there was Irish unity, that would have profound effects in Scotland as well. And I'd like to say more of that later on. But um, to stick with the theme about the, uh, the impact of Scottish independence, I don't think enough thought in Scotland has been given uh, to the knock-on effects of independence and breaking the union. Um, in Scotland, and certainly among nationalists, I would have to say, there is, when, when Ireland um, is raised, the focus is almost exclusively on the South. They take a detour around Northern Ireland. It's too difficult. Um, it raises too many questions which are very close to home in Scotland, and they would rather not discuss them. Um, and this, I think, was very uh, clear back in 2014 in the independence referendum campaign then. Now, I have to say that neither the yes side nor the no side actually considered Irish issues at all, as far as I can see. Um, the yes side certainly did not consider how a vote for independence would or might destabilise Northern Ireland, or affect the uneasy peace in Northern Ireland. And let me say here that it's in very much in Scotland's interest that Northern Ireland is at peace. Um, and then secondly, those on the no side, when they were pushing for more powers and so on for a Scottish Parliament um, as a way of persuading people not to vote for independence, 
Um, they were not giving any consideration to the knock-on effects of that in terms of the devolution settlement, the impact and perhaps in the Barnett formula and so on. So if there is another independence referendum in Scotland anytime soon, I hope there is a proper Irish dimension. Now, I could also say something about the lack of understanding here uh, about Scottish issues, but uh, I'm too polite to do that. Um, but what I would like to say is just touch on something that previous speakers have said about the, the relationships across these islands. Uh, I think this is fascinating. Um, these relationships are messy. Uh, they're often fractious. Uh, they're always in transition. But there is a lot there in terms of social and cultural interaction. I think they're very rich in those things. And they're very rich in potential for future cooperation and sharing. And at this point, I would throw out um, a body, uh, the, the, I would mention a body which is, is really much neglected, and that is the British Irish Council. Uh, part of that strand three, as, as you'll all know, of the Good Friday Agreement, um, which now has a secretariat in Edinburgh, although the Scottish government doesn't seem to be particularly interested um, in it at all, because given the secret uh, secretariats in Edinburgh, I think the Scottish government have got to be the driver of this body. Now, this is a body which potentially could be used to smooth out a lot of these constitutional issues and tensions and so on. And yet, we hardly, it flies under the radar. We hardly take any notice of it. So let me, let me make a, a brief mention there of that. Some 20 years ago, um, when relationships within these islands were discussed, it tend, there was a discourse around what might be called lives entwined. In fact, that was the, the title of a couple of books of essays uh, that were produced at that time, looking at the interrelationships, um, looking at the interactions, looking at how uh, these relationships might develop in the future. And now, thanks to the Scottish question, thanks especially to Brexit and the calamitous fallout from Brexit, uh, and to the protocol difficulties in Northern Ireland, I think now we are talking about lives separated. We're talking about positive interactions being disrupted. And that to me is a great pity. Um, Mari talked about the inevitability of Scottish independence. I, I think we really need to be cautious about using words like inevitable and notions of being on the right side of history and so on. Um, these are very risky notions indeed. And uh, the SNP's recent troubles, well, who would have seen that coming not so long ago? Um, so better, nothing is certain, but I, I do think that we can still uh, produce a, a set of better relations between our, each other and bring out the best in each other. Now, perhaps necessary to this, um, and here I declare an interest because I'm a Labour Party member, um, is a new government, a Labour government in Westminster. And it would actually be my preference that that Labour government is, has not got an overall majority and would be dependent on the Liberals uh, for support because the Liberals, I think, would push them in the direction of constitutional reform, of, of granting PR at long, long last, um, of perhaps going down the road that Gordon Brown has recently sketched out in terms of uh, a reformed United Kingdom, um, perhaps even leading in time to a federal United Kingdom, and that's certainly something that I would welcome. And what I think also unionists need to do, uh, and what they, they have lamentably failed to do, and Mike's an exception because Mike does try and engage with these things, but too many don't, certainly in the other unionist party we could talk about, um, is to engage with those plans for reforming the United Kingdom, because it's eminently in the unionist interest in Northern Ireland that the United Kingdom should be reformed and they should wake up at long last to, uh, and realise that they, are, they do not have allies in the Conservative Party in Britain. Thank you. Thank you very much, Graham. Our final speaker is Paul Gillespie. Paul's well known to this audience. He's been engaged with this institute from the outset and has edited many books on the relationship between Britain and Ireland. 
Uh, he's formerly worked with the Irish Times and is now very heavily involved in University College Dublin in looking at the, the future constitutional arrangements uh, within these islands. Paul. Thank you very much and thanks for the opportunity to speak. And uh, I, I welcome this very much because it opens up the questions, in, as other speakers have said, about uh, the period of change we're living through, uh, the structural change in the UK, and the way in which this affects Ireland. And we need to think that through. Um, uh, we have got the uh, trauma of Brexit uh, as a, a drama, a part of that drama. And it's necessary, therefore, for us looking from the Republic to be prudent and uh, for researchers, policymakers, citizens uh, to understand these changes and how they interlink with one another and to prepare for them. Uh, as we like, quite a way, it's, this is all a, a setting that's always changing, but sometimes history speeds up and changes in very unexpected ways. Uh, and in the work we've been doing in UCD, uh, we've been trying to get such a discussion going and contribute to it uh, with the Mini Citizens Assemblies on the possible shape of United Ireland. Uh, they work with the Royal Irish Academy on North-South relations, which is really ongoing and very valuable. A working group, uh, I was part of a working group from the University College London, thinking about uh, referendums North and South, I reported a couple of years ago. And I'm now involved with, indeed, with Nicola uh, McEwen and Michael Keating as editors of a book, uh, which we are, uh, um, and it's, it comes out of a project on Britishness, Irishness, and institutional links. And the title of the book we have is Conflicting Sovereignties Across Britain and Ireland, Identities, uh, Institutions, and Futures. And we've got a, a, a group of 20 or 21 British and Irish authors, mainly academic authors, mainly political scientists, but historians and lawyers too, uh, looking at the interlinked issues we've discussed, paired British and Irish authors, younger and older, and well-established and less well-established scholarship. And that's a, a contribution. It's been good fun doing this, and, and it really opens up many of the points that have been made already. And uh, we have a, a Newman Fellowship opening up in, um, in UCD, uh, looking at where unionism is going, both in, in Britain and in Ireland, and how that impacts on nationalism uh, uh, north and south. Now, that structural tension in the UK, what is driving it? If we want to understand this, we need to really concentrate here on how this affects the North and how it affects the Republic. And our research is identifying several uh, major strands uh, in this, particularly after the Brexit uh, events. The degree of divergence or convergence between British policymaking, UK policymaking, uh, and European policymaking is a very central issue. And all of the dramas in the last seven years through the Tory party and Tory governments about that, you know, tells that story. We're now at it, we passed a moment of maximum divergence, arguably, and are heading back towards convergence. Uh, but that really does make a difference. It, 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 we see the politics of the protocol of the and the, and, the, and, the, and the framework in that, but it also affects Scotland, it affects Wales, and it affects the very structure of the UK itself. Secondly, the way in which the pattern of government in the UK is centralised, centralised going way back in the way that Mike is identifying, but also really is uh, through the Brexit process, because competences, governmental competences brought back to, uh, to, uh, to, to the UK, where do they lie? Do they lie in the devolved authorities or do they lie in Westminster? A lot of the drama about devolutionary politics since Brexit, in Scotland particularly, has been playing out around those issues and how they justify the independence argument or not. So so the case may be. Um, now, the um, work we're doing on this identifies what this affects uh, you know, on unionism. There is a, what we call a neo-unionism, uh, which has to do with devolution. And it opens up this huge question in the UK's governance of whether it's, it is a unitary, a unitary unionism with a unitary state with absolute Westminster sovereignty, that great formula, or whether it's pluralist 
and uh, uh, understands that sovereignty must be shared and divided, understands that nationalisms interact with one another and their interest objectives, understands that territory and territorial government has many functional aspects that, that create interdependencies, as we've been discussing, and that those interdependencies will continue irrespective of the particular form the Constitution of Futures take. And I'll come back to that point. Scotland's role here is crucial. Um, it's a laboratory of change. Uh, it's towards, if you look, uh, we've been drawing, understanding uh, those driving forces. You, we brought them together into several scenarios of potential change. One of them is a, a reformed, renegotiated union of the kind perhaps that, uh, that Graham was identifying. Uh, another would be uh, a breakup. Uh, or a, a, a disintegration leading to break up into four constituent units. In between or related to those are what I call a differentiated union, uh, where you would have the uh, uh, Northern Ireland differentiation coming out of the protocol access to, different, to the two big markets uh, applied also in Scotland. And that's been a demand, recurrent demand in Scotland. It's unlikely in our analysis. Uh, and of course, the, the old federal uh, UK uh, idea, which is still there as an ideal, it's elements of it in the Brown and other plans. Uh, but the question, the big question there is whether there's the um, political will to get there. And that really big question is, can the UK, can it reform uh, and go for that renegotiation or, or can't it? How does it have the capacity to do that? And uh, it seems to, to us in our analysis, yes, certainly a new deal is needed, uh, but there is coming through this history of the last seven years two additional elements uh, to the relations to Brussels and the centralization, what I call dysfunctionality. It's the effects of Brexit economically uh, and politically and culturally, you want one, one can argue, and the effect of this prolonged uh, agonizing about where they stand uh, is simply becoming a much less effective union uh, for people to want to be in, whether in Scotland, Wales, or Northern Ireland, or indeed in England too. And the second aspect is the loss of the old statecraft, uh, the chum theory of government that used to hold the uh, UK together without it, lots of the rules being written down. Th that has collapsed. So there's a deep requirement for change, and uh, the question is whether that can happen. And my final remark is these are problems just as much for unionists as for nationalists in Ireland. Uh, whatever happens in Scotland, what happens with the structural change in the UK? And we share this and need to talk about it much more. That's why I welcome particularly Graham and his recent book uh, on this, uh, to this uh, discussion. We need to do that preparation, that analysis. We need to think beyond or the, uh, the alternative to a reformed UK is a transformed uh, uh, governance, which would take probably that shape uh, of, of, of independence all around. But beyond that, there is the continuing interdependency, uh, the, that territorial interfunctionality that I referred to. And that could take federal, confederal lines uh, between Scotland, England, Wales, Ireland, uh, 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 Northern, and Northern Ireland. Uh, that's a potential which we're exploring in our research. And one way of describing that, which is an interesting way to get a discussion going, is that this might be a, a unionism beyond the union. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, I want to thank all our speakers for more or less staying within the seven minutes. You were very good, all of you. Um, you you've been, that's been a very lot, a great deal of interesting material that we've just heard. Um, if you have a question to ask, just please say who you are. And if you want to direct it to somebody, uh, direct it to somebody. And I will also take questions, of course, from people who are online. Uh, first, Francis Jacob. Francis Jacobs, member of the Institute. Um, I think a theme running through all all your uh, talks is the only alternative to independence or unity is some kind of reformed United Kingdom. How do you think that that can be achieved when, as you pointed out, England is so dominant? I can't think of any federal system where one component is so dominant. And is this the moment, or does that make it even more impossible to start talking about having a written constitution for the United Kingdom? I think that's really for the for the panel. Uh, you're right. It's, um, it's always going to be difficult, very challenging. 
Um, Gordon Brown's recent proposals included the reform of the House of Lords into an assembly of the nations and regions. Um, I think that that would be a very useful balancing act uh, in terms of the, the what, what you rightly say is England's uh, greater numbers, greater needs, and, and so on. On the other hand, um, I think Mike mentioned the city deals that are going on in England. England's a bit of a patchwork at the moment. In fact, I really don't have a grasp of how these city deals are working. I mean, in Manchester, for example, Andy Burnham seems to be uh, making great strides. He seems to have quite significant powers. He's got powers over health, um, things like that, transport. Um, in other places, you know, it, it's hardly noticeable, you know, what, what powers are there. So I, I would like to see this move to a situation where um, powers and responsibilities are more clearly demarcated. I think a written constitution is absolutely essential. Now, um, back in the 90s, when all, all this was being discussed, there was uh, two schools of thought, one that, that, that kind of favoured a big bang, and somehow doing this overnight, uh, the other one, which was more gradualist. And I think that's the more realistic one. It's got to be more gradualist. But I do think the center of gravity in, in UK pol or British politics is, is left of center. I mean, that is often concealed by conservatives being in office. But I do think that if that left of center, uh, center of gravity can be established, and buried down, then I do think we can we can move to a reformed UK, but I'm not underestimating the difficulties. Um, so first of all, I, I should say, when I say that Scotland, I think Scotland will, it's inevitable that Scottish independence will happen. It's precisely because of the point that you've raised. Now, with the greatest of respect, genuinely, Scotland and certainly the, the Scottish people have been listening to both Conservative, but predominantly the Labour Party promise and reform for over 100 years. This has been on the table before, whether it be the House of Lords, whether it be proportional representation, and it still just isn't happening. So I don't see any evidence to suggest that this time it will be different. And in reference to particularly Gordon Brown's paper, I found a really interesting paper. Um, and actually the first half of it for me partly made the case for independence because he talked about the decline of the UK, whether it's economically or whether it's institutionally. It, that Britain is not keeping up with the rest of the world. And what we see happening is, and uh, I can't remember who, sorry, but someone uh, was talking about divergence. And ultimately this is where I am for independence as opposed to devolution, because I think if you have, if, even if you look at the, the state of Britain just now, you have in Scotland where election after election, it is a centre-left party that is being endorsed. We haven't voted Conservative since 1955, and yet the vast majority of governments have been Conservative. And wh what we've seen happen since devolution and since 1998 is that wherever we can, whether it's SNP or uh, the previous Labour and Lib Dem coalition, we veered to the left uh, as and when we could. Now, the, the reality is, even just politically and institutionally, there's only so much divergence uh, a, a solid unit can take. And if you have two of the, the largest parts of this United Kingdom constantly going in different directions and wanting different things. And you have ultimately that English dominance winning time and time again. It's not a sustainable process. And that's why it, to me, it is inevitable because ultimately what's either going to happen is devolution is going to be rolled back because I think in many respects, Westminster's had a bit of a fright and seeing what has happened. And we're already seeing that with things like the Internal Market Act or attempts to circumvent devolution in the democratic process. But also we, we see this desire to keep a concentration of power. So the choices are then, do you keep giving more powers to the de devolved assemblies if you're doing that, then why not go the full way? And when we're talking about things like the British Irish Council, I see no reason why 
there wouldn't be constructive relationships between independent nations within the British Isles. To me, that's a much healthier position to be in apart from anything else. So when, when I say that it's inevitable, it's because to me, logically, all, all routes end up there. It either ends up that we lose the devolution that we've achieved or we go the full hog. Sorry, I'll ask uh, Mike first and then Nicola. You're reminding me of, of an occasion when I was a very young reporter with the BBC going to Westminster uh, and doing some interviews about the prospect of a Labour government uh, when it was a Conservative government in, in place at the time. And I interviewed the late Tony Benn on the terrace. Uh, and, and he said famously, he, he kind of gave me a history of the empire, the collapse of the empire. And in his own words, he said, so unionists should not be worrying about a Labour government. If unionists are going to get shafted, it will be the Tories that'll do it. Uh, and of course, the Conservative Party is, is, is famous for, you know, they will do just about anything to preserve power or certainly to preserve the party. So if we're going to make advances, I think we need to have a really radical change of political culture. So think back to 98 and the Belfast Agreement. Why did that happen? Because you had two leaders in John Hume and David Trimble who understood the concept of the greater good. In other words, the needs of the people came ahead of your party political interests. The difficulty, of course, is over the last 25 years, we have seen the impact of putting the people first on those two parties. So it's hardly an incentive for anybody else uh, to walk in their shoes. But if we're genuine, as I am, and thinking the only way to really affect proper change is to get power and decision-making as close to the family unit as you can then you have to do that. But it's counterintuitive. Are you mute, Nicola? Oh, hi, sorry. Um, yeah, I, on, I mean, I don't see, I hate to say it's never, never but anything, but I see very little prospect of the UK becoming a federation not because of the size of England relative to the others, because if you look around the world, that's not that unusual. California has a population of 40 million. The smallest states in the US are half a million. So the size disparity is not the issue. The fact that you have one constituent territory um, and three smaller ones, I think that is, that is an issue uh, that makes it practically difficult, but it's not impossible. I think why I see very little prospect of it is I don't see anybody, including the Liberal Democrats, pushing for this to happen in a way that would divide parliamentary sovereignty and create, in a sense, a, a, a rival power in terms of the, the, the government and parliament of England. And there's not really much in the way of thinking on how you would do that, but it isn't impossible to devise uh, a solution if the will was there. I just don't see the will being there. Um, I just want to say one thing on the, the Brown Commission um, proposals. I mean, I, I, I agree that, uh, I think Mary was making the point that the, the diagnosis of the problem, in the sense, is, is, is one that many could uh, agree with and, and, and share. Um, I think when it gets to some of the resolutions, that's when the document gets a little bit sketchier um, and um, leaves out some of the challenges um, associated with some of the proposals, including um, the proposal for a reform or replace, replacing the House of Lords with the Chamber of Nations and Regions, which has been in Labour manifestos for some time. Um, this paper goes a little bit further, but actually doesn't go all that far in terms of working out how you would do that and, in particular, how that would affect devolution. And I actually see the potential if you were to do that in the way that was suggested in terms of electing um, a, a chamber of nations and regions is probably um, potentially undermining devolution as much as it strengthens it because the relationship between it and the devolved institutions would be um, well, very unclear uh, as the plans uh, are laid out so far. Thank you. Do you want to say something, Paul? Yeah, I, 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 following on that, I, I, 
uh, the diagnosis in that Brown Commission is, is very, it's solid, really strong, and uh, particularly about the centralization, the whole structure of government, including the governance of England. Uh, work, again, that I'm doing with Michael Keating and John Denham. John Denham is a former Labour MP who's doing very interesting work on English identity and English structures. Come back and back to this. And uh, I think where each of us are skeptical in the way that Nicola is, is suggesting uh, about the second half of those proposals and whether the will, the capacity is there to do it, given the countervailing forces, the search for that majority, uh, whether I understand Graham's uh, observations about, about you know, the desirable outcome with a, with a liberal government, because part of, of, the, of the necessary shift constitutionally is the electoral system in, 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 in Britain uh, towards PR. And I just wonder whether the capacity is there and the will. And if not, my, the, my argument about dysfunction and statecraft come through strongly and may in a, in a, in a galloping way. You know, this, these lessons will be learned fast. I have a question which uh, is really a follow on from the same question. Uh, during the course of the Brexit negotiations, the British government, which was essentially an English government, they effectively ignored the three devolved parliaments or assemblies. You know, there was a, a sort they, they they said they would establish arrangements at the beginning which would take account of what Scotland had to say or Northern Ireland had to say or Wales had to say. But in effect, during the course of the negotiations, they didn't do so. It was negotiated practically as an English government. Has this had any effect in Scotland or Wales or Northern Ireland? Because if you look at what happened here, the Irish government was able to look after its interests in a way that none of the devolved uh, assemblies or parliaments were able to do. And the only reason why the Irish government was able to do it was because we're an independent state. Is it okay for me to jump Please. in there? <laughs> I I I completely agree with you entirely there, and I suppose one of the the things that I'm often asked or that gets thrown at me is, you want to leave one union but you want to join another because of course we believe uh, an independent Scotland we would love to see it back within the EU, and my answer to that is, unions are not inherently bad they are not it's about how they are made up and how the power is shared amongst uh, the different nations and whilst I, I always take the point you know that England does have a, a bigger population that, than the other uh, countries within the, the union but we are countries we're not regions and when you compare the United Kingdom set up with exactly what you just described there where Ireland was able to stand up for its own interests knowing that it had the backing of the rest of the the eu and having that ability to to veto things if it's not in your nation's interest that mechanism just does not exist in the uk and it has never been more starkly shown as it has through the brexit process okay um, yeah, I, I mean it seems to me um unionist problem is the messiness or the uh, complexity of the union itself. Um, the union is a, a very complex construct. Um, there, is, there are so many interests in it, there are so many variations, there are so many different concepts of what the union should be. Um, this makes defending it very diff much more difficult than just taking uh, a, a nationalist position to say that, right, Scottish independence, that's the answer, and then untold benefits will flow. And Irish unity, that's the answer, and then, then it's all wine and roses. Um, the, the, these are facile kind of um, alternatives, in my view. Um, I think there's virtue in grappling with the complexities, let me put it that way. Um, I think that the union is worth preserving because simply, and, and I'm really glad to hear Mary say that, that you know, there's nothing wrong intrinsically with unions. Um, shared sovereignty, absolutely. But I do wonder, you know, to what extent are the SNP or indeed Sinn Féin in that uh, respect actually in the spirit of the EU? I know they mouth platitudes about being pro-EU and so on, but really are they about sharing sovereignty? Um, I wonder. 
Um, to me, it's an old fashioned nation state kind of perspective. Um, I absolutely take the point about uh, the calamity of Brexit, the, this muscular unionism which has emerged in its aftermath, which is a disaster for unionists. Um, if that prevails, then the union doesn't really have a future as far as I'm concerned. It can only go down the road that I, I've been suggesting, however difficult and uh, twist and turn, how many twists and turns there are. But I, I just say that the, you know it's, it, you cannot kind of regard this as um, you know a neat division between defending the union on one hand and, and advocating uh, independence or Irish unity in the other. Um, you know the two different projects. Mike, do you want to say anything? This stage. Um, yeah, I, I, I think the kind of the kind of standard nationalist argument is, why do you want to be part of the United Kingdom and have you know, eighteen MPs out of six hundred and fifty, whereas in in the kind of traditional United Ireland sense, uh, you'll represent a very significant uh, minority of people on the island and potentially perpetually hold the balance of power in Northern Ireland. And you know, do you really want Jeffrey Donaldson choosing your Taoiseach every time you have an election? That's a, a question maybe for uh, for another day. The, the, the way I see the future for us is unionists to a certain extent to, to get over ourselves because Northern Ireland is only 1.9 million people. And yes, England is much bigger. Europe is much bigger. I think those unionists who, who supported Brexit made a huge strategic error uh, because whatever... Brexit was going to mean for GB or for England, it was always shaping up to be a disaster uh, for Northern Ireland. And, and that has come back, I think, to, to bite us very hard. Why did they not realise that Europe has every right to protect the integrity of its single market? But that, as with rights, you, you, you end up with a tension because the UK has the right to decide how the four component parts trade internally. And that is the tension with with the with the other with the other thing, I would just like to see uh, more cooperation uh, because of Brexit and then because the institutions were down. That wasn't just Stormont; that was the North South bodies, which are really important now because, given the Brexit, which puts the government of Ireland on one side of the table, the UK government and ourselves on the other, that's your only forum where you get together and remind yourself of our mutual interests of simple things like. You're not going to build an acute hospital in Dundalk if you're building an acute hospital in Newry. You know, just sensible, sensible cooperation. And that, of course, applies to, to our relationship with England, Scotland and Wales as well. But I think until the kind of majority of unionists um, admit to buyer's regret in terms of Brexit, then, then we're, we're, we're a little bit delusional. We have created a bed that we don't want to lie in. Uh, and we need to really sort that out. Well, it's interesting, Mike, that uh, the day before yesterday, Farage admitted that he may have made a mistake over here. And then, please. Jane McCulloch from the Department of Foreign Affairs. Until recently, I had the great fortune to be in Edinburgh as Ireland's Consul General, where I knew Nicola very well. So my question picks up on some points that I think have been touched on by all the panellists. Um, particularly regard to the difference between Scotland and Northern Ireland's constitutional, legislative and practical uh, places within the UK and the arrangements for them and how any of the panellists, and I'm, I'm not sure everyone will give an opinion on this, but certainly Graham and Nicola, I hope, will, how you might reflect on how the understanding of those differences have evolved through the Brexit process, given at various times when different deals and under negotiation, how there were calls for absolute uh, mirroring of those between Northern Ireland and Scotland. Thank you. Thank you. Would I do it? Thank you, Nicola. <laughs> Sorry, could, could you repeat a little bit of the question I was struggling to hear? Sorry, Nicola, I'll be brief this time. How thinking has evolved in various circles uh, in Scotland about the differences between the arrangements for Scotland within the Union and Northern Ireland's position. Uh, if when we think back to the calls that were made over recent years for mirroring deals through Brexit for Scotland and Northern Ireland and what, what evolution we've seen. Um, I don't know if I've seen much 
evolution in terms of shared understanding. I mean, I think in, in, from a Scotland perspective, um, I think there's probably a little bit of envy um, at the, the arrangements that have been um, made for Northern Ireland, but also sympathy with um, Northern Ireland's situation. And I think there is recognition um, that, you know, obviously there is a difficult history and a, and, and a, a desire on all sides, wherever people, people, well, for the most part, wherever people stood on Brexit to, to um, avoid sort of difficult issues at the border. But I think what is interesting is, in particular since the Windsor framework, is that I think that probably um, feeds into aspiration um, as well as to what could be possible in the context of, of Scotland being an independent member of the European Union, because clearly Brexit and um, the TCA as it stands would create major, major headaches uh, for an independent Scotland um, with respect to the border, the land border that it shares um, with, with England. Um, and I think the Windsor framework does open up some, some hope perhaps uh, of ways that that might be navigated um, and um, the, the, the challenges associated with it um, managed um, more effectively than they might otherwise have been. Um, do you want to say something, Ryan? Sure. It, the first thing I should say is, of course, Scotland uh, and Ireland have a shared history, shared culture. However, our recent histories and the intensity of conflict is, of course, incredibly different. And I think it's absolutely right that the work did go into that maintaining that peace process. And I'm very glad to see the Windsor framework in action. But as you, uh, as Nicola says, yes, I'm jealous of it. I'm incredibly jealous because, again, to, to go back to 2016, of course, there wasn't a single uh, council authority within Scotland that voted for Brexit. It was across the board wanting to remain similar to a uh, Northern Ireland majority voting to remain. So why is it that they get a deal that Scotland specifically asked for? Now, from my point of view, I, I do believe an independent Scotland should be in the EU because I think it makes sense globally. Uh, and I think not just economically, but I think security wise, it also makes sense. But I'm okay to compromise because of course, part of our responsibility in being in government in Scotland is we have to respect where people are at and whether we like it or not people did vote to stay part of this union and I, I, it doesn't stop me continuing to argue for independence but we have to respect that and so long as we are, are part of this union we still have a duty to fight for the best possible deal for Scotland. And that deal, that compromise to us was, OK, if you can't give us full EU access, we'll take the single market then, because it's key to us. We also want to see freedom of movement continue, because Scotland, for all intents and purposes, is, is to an extent empty. It, we need people to come in. We need immigrants to come in and give us their skills and give us their talents and they have enriched Scottish life um, so long as we were part of Europe but we've seen that now collapse so yes I, where there are of course intrinsic differences between Northern Ireland and Scotland I do see no reason as to why we weren't given the same deal as they were and the cynic in me thinks it was because also one of the major scare or, or one of the arguments that is often made by Westminster is that if Scotland goes independent, there will be a hard border between Scotland and England, which I genuinely do not think would be the case because it wouldn't be in England's interests either. And of course, this Windsor framework shows that it's perfectly possible to have separate, to have a border that's not necessarily a hard border. And for from a Westminster point of view, I think they consider it political suicide to admit that to people in Scotland. 
So for me, the cynic in me thinks that's why we didn't get the, the deal that we asked for um, in Northern Ireland did. Paul? Yeah, I think you head towards a Labour government which might push further convergence this side of re-entering re, re the EU uh, between London and, and Brussels, in which case the border would get softer, the potential border Scotland-England. Uh, the paradox of that is that actually might make independence uh, more attractive to Scottish voters uh, because they wouldn't have this big border problem to contend with. So the, this is very complex. This is a complex set of issues, a complex union, uh, but it, and it has paradoxical outcomes the more you understand that complexity uh, politically. Thank you. We have very little time left, Catherine. Yeah, sorry, Catherine Meenan, member of the Institute. I just want to go back to sort of the first wave of this discussion, which is very, everybody knows exactly what they want, everybody sees the barriers to achieving what they want. Um, and Paul particularly was making the point that enormous change will be necessary in the, in the United Kingdom constitutional position. Um, but the big doubt is whether the capacity is there to deliver on it. So is the sad conclusion not that things have to get an awful lot worse before they can get better? Person? No. <laughs> <laughs> Who'd like to take out a poll? Anybody who wants to go. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yes, and it's not, they're not just the Boris, uh, the, the, the Boris Tory type of problems, just the incapacity uh, to deal with these issues. And we've used Gramsci in this, this you know, when, when the old count uh, is dying and the new cannot be born, you get a period of morbidity. Uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting way to understand the UK's problems. Uh, I'm, you know, irrespective of whether we want to see that reformed UK or a transformed set of islands, uh, you're, this is the central question that we're facing. I know that, Graham. I think the, the worst of that post-Brexit um, uh, kind of insularity, uh, particularly in England, that English nationalism that uh, has been mentioned, I think that might... Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. They didn't think about Ireland either. <laughs> yeah. 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 Mm. yeah, But I think more and more people are waking up to these absurdities, yeah. and you know, I honestly think that the worst of it's possibly passed, in the sense that you know there's a, there's a kind of Middle England opinion. It's a rather uh, sort of um, convenient phrase to use, I know, but I, I do think there, there is a, an awakening among those that perhaps voted Brexit for, for quite what they thought were quite sensible reasons, not immigration, for other reasons, for, for economic reasons, perhaps. Um, and that's dawning on them now that the, this is not happening. And uh, I, I do think there's a swing in opinion. I think the Labour Party are, are, are actually sort of too far behind it in, in a way. They should be getting out in front of it and saying, well, come on, we, we, single market, as Mary says, is it, absolutely the way to go. If, if things have to get worse before they get better, this will be my last appearance as an elected representative. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's, it's, I think it's, it's not a good. But I, I am I'm actually optimistic uh, for Northern Ireland because I think a lot of people, and not just unions now, realise that the first thing you have to do is unite the people and make Northern Ireland work. And that's measured by you know, the public services. It's, it's measured by people waking up in the morning and getting out of bed because they've got something to do, a job that they consider worthwhile, having their children well-educated, having a health service that's there for them. You, know, you can define that. And actually, even if you want constitutional change, I think there are even those within Sinn Féin who traditionally unionists look on and say, well, they don't want the country to work and look at their narrative. Northern Ireland's a failed, ungovernable statelet. Why are the DUP playing that narrative is another question, by the way. But anyway, they now realise that flies against the first rule of marketing, which is when you have a border poll, whatever you're selling, make it easy to buy. Now, who wants to buy a failed, ungovernable statelet? Yeah. So I think Sinn Féin even are realising well, what we've got to do is make Northern Ireland work. Mm. And there's, there is now a, a sense for me, and I am being optimistic, that there's a sense of common purpose beginning to emerge. I'm an absolute cynic. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I wasn't, but truthfully, the reason that I say that is because I would always favour 
a Labour government over a Conservative one any day of the week. But where I run into difficulty is that certainly in the present, but also in the recent past, I think that on the big issues, Labour are relatively in the same position, uh, take the same positions as the Conservatives, whether that be with Brexit or with immigration or with the direction of travel when it comes to fiscal policy, austerity, for instance. And all of these things, I truly believe and know just from working with my constituents, Britain has become a worse place to be just now. And not just in terms of the decline in standards of living, but also in terms of the, the toxicity of many debates. And th there has been real decline in the ability to debate, particularly coming from where I work. Um, so in a sense, part of me thinks things might get worse. Uh, presumably they will get worse if both major parties stay on the, the path that they're on. My hope then is that that will nudge people towards demanding something better, um, which is, I think, what we have seen in Scotland since the implementation of devolution. It has slowly been rise, raising the confidence of, of people in Scotland, being able to see in key areas, oh, we actually can do things slightly differently and slightly better. And long may that last and continue, um, but I do fear that things will get much, much worse um, before they start getting better. Thank you. I think we've uh, come to the end. I'm sorry, we are not able to take all your questions, both in the room and also uh, on the on the uh, uh, on the Zoom. Uh, I'd like to thank our panel for a very stimulating and interesting discussion. It's it's been very interesting indeed. Uh, one issue that has not been mentioned, uh, if there are significant changes within the union, is the question, and we've seen it in the last few weeks, of the crown. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.